Welcome to Web Chat Wednesday. I'm Chris and I'm here with Artie. We are studio guides at the Billie Jean King Main Library in downtown Long Beach. And today's guest is David Hedden. David Hedden is a designer based in Long Beach who has been involved with a variety of projects within the community, including urban agriculture, aquaponics, sustainable design, art installations, and maker spaces. He currently works as a lecturer at Cal State Long Beach in the design department. Thank you for joining us today, David. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Dave. Is there anything you'd like to uh, add about about yourself, you know, for the intro? Anything we left out? Um, snowboard in the winter. That's a good one. But uh, sustainability backpacker in the summer. And uh, yeah, that's about all. We'll just jump right into it. So uh, where, where are your favorite places in Long Beach? Favorite places in Long Beach. Um, lately, the dog beach has been a highlight, taking the dogs down there and, you know, finding a place to, you know, get outdoors, you know, with some social distance. Um, let's see, what else? Like El Dorado Park, you know, any places to kind of get outdoors and kind of get away from the, the city feel, kind of get away from the traffic sounds. And I mean, I would say all the, the gardens that I visit, those are all, all the highlights of Long Beach. Every, every garden is like a little, you know, oasis away from uh, the hustle and bustle. So one of the projects you worked on was uh, Bird Up. What inspired the project? And can you explain a little bit more about that project? Sure. Uh, Bird Up is um, like an artist awareness collaboration uh, for creating awareness about sustainability purposes um and using the arts to get people excited about it so the idea was it was really um trying to cater to a specific grant proposal which was the a lot series the arts council was putting on an event to engage the public um, so that was a big criteria was how to engage with the public um, but i really wanted to focus on bringing sustainable awareness um, and from just my background in sustainability uh, it can be kind of tiresome to be, you know, preached about like sustainability. So I tried to find a more playful way to get people to get excited about doing things more sustainably. So that's where uh, having done stuff with a bunch of artists and, you know, instead of, you know, just being me to kind of being the show, I wanted to enable more artists to get involved. So uh, the idea is, you know, I, I built hundreds of birdhouses and then used them as blank canvases to share with the artist community and then they put their spin on it and whatever design art um, to, you know, really, they can say whatever they want, but just collectively, it gets people to be thinking more deeply about, um, you know, what the art is on a birdhouse and then what does the birdhouse mean? Where does the birdhouse go? Um, what are things that, you know, help encourage a bird to want to go into birdhouse, you know? so it, I feel like it's a, a playful way to get people to think a little bit more deeply about, you know, things that they might just be see as everyday objects. Um, and I guess another just parallel idea is just creating a, a dialogue uh, of how nature can exist within the city. So a lot of people think of, you know, nature as being something separate, but really like we're, we have micro environments and, um, you know, you know, ecosystems on very small scales in the city. So, you know, how do we, you know, pr uh, see that perspective also? What's your favorite bird? Ooh, uh, favorite bird, huh? It's uh, the the puffin from like Alaska and up in the Arctic, because uh, it's kind of like people look at it; it looks like a clown. So it's got that kind of funny appearance, you know, and kind of makes it unique. But at the same time, it's like a water bird. So I, I love the water. It goes fishing. It catches fish. It, you know, it's it's kind of like on the the edge of really rough, you know, coastlines, things like that. So it's like it's kind of I've I've only seen them a couple times, and it's always been like a highlight when I do see them because it just seems like. Um, anyways, that that's one bird I would say. Um, I don't know. I'm a big bird fanatic, so I could probably list off a bunch, but I'll leave it at the puffin. One of my favorite projects of yours is the Box of Boom. Can you tell us about this project and what inspired it? Yeah, so there's a couple things. Another, This is another one where um, 
it was kind of taking a bunch of ideas that have been kind of percolating in my mind or um, other collaborators' minds, and then having um, an, a grant opportunity or an event opportunity to apply to. So in this case, it was Music Tastes Good uh, Music Festival in Long Beach um, was looking for having an artist call um, for their following summer festival. Uh, around the same time, uh, fellow studio guide, uh, Gabriel Guete, Gabotron, he, we were together, we went up and visited Maker Fair in San Francisco. It's kind of like the culmination of yearly maker events around the world. And while we were there, we were inspired by another maker group called Pony Trap, who makes a robot drummer for their band. So kind of uh, percolating on that idea of how we could make our own kind of noise interactive machine and apply it to uh, the Music Tastes Good Festival and make it interactive. How do people, because the, the Pony Trap is great for their band. They have their own drummer, but it's not interactive. And it's not like people can just walk up and play it. Um, so anyways, you know, thinking of like video games and arcade games and how people can just walk up and kind of s smash the buttons. Um, and then ha like maybe combining that with a big robotic drum machine where people could walk up and almost play the arcade or play a drum machine like an arcade game. So, um, so Gabe and I were talking about that on the drive back from Maker Fair. And I have, I also have a background playing drums in some bands in Long Beach. So I, I just happened to have a couple drum sets that weren't being used. So the idea was let's make a larger than life boom box that looks you know, like a six foot, seven foot tall boom box filled with analog drum sets just you know, all throughout and robotically controlled so that people can walk up and, you know, kind of like Street Fighter, you know, battle each other with the, the arcade buttons. And um, so it's actually been a, a good hit and we've taken it a lot of different places since then. And it's really big and heavy and takes lots of people to move and a U-Haul truck. Um, but we're, we, you know, since then it's been evolving. It has like a really complex brain system that we've been refining and going to cut new ones and we're going to make a small version that's like a lunchbox size, or we have prototypes of a lunchbox version or like a backpack version. So it's really, you know, people get excited by it. And um, so for that reason, it's been really fun by the engagement that people have had with it. Um, but it's also been like a combination of, um, you know, it, it's fully collaborative. There's no way that I could have done it myself. It's only because, you know, I got stuck somewhere and someone else came in and, and helped solve that problem that had then another person come in with a suggestion. And so it's just evolved in complexity, but also collaboration. So I, I would say, yeah, Bird Up and Box of Boom are like, you know, kind of those those hallmark projects of mine where I, I'm excited because of the, the collaboration element. That's a, a big aspect that I feel needs to be part of it. Were there any like massive roadblocks any like something that kind of prevented you from moving forward? You know, definitely like some uh, tight moments, um, like where everything worked up until like midnight the night before the big festival premiere. And then like a circuit burns and smoke goes out of the circuit board. And then we're like, you know, kind of retracing everything all the way back. And it's like stuff like that you just, you know, can't anticipate. Um, but Every time we've, you know, you know, it's it's all come right back together right at the perfect moment. So those things have been great. Um, I mean, we definitely, um, let's see, like had some like parts where we got stuck and, you know, it just, it really did take someone else to come in and kind of look at it from a different perspective. Um, so things like, you know, being a drummer, there's like certain complexities, you know, it's like, different volumes that you're trying to convey. And so, you know, a robot can be pretty, you know, not, not very precise. And so trying to add complexity or precision, you know, that, that started getting, making it more challenging and having to up our abilities in terms of programming or what the motors and electronics can do. And so, yeah, there, there's been a lot of head scratching at, at certain times. And that's kind of the fun of it too, is like, we're kind of doing a puzzle together that we know what it's supposed to look like, but we don't know how the pieces fit together yet. But, you know, it's, it's all, all the technologies out there is just kind of making it work for what you want it to do. 
Awesome. Yeah, I think it's a great project. I think sometimes people are scared to pick up an instrument or, you know, it just, they don't think it's their thing. But I think the, the Box of Boom enables people who don't even play instruments or the drums specifically to just go up and play, press press the buttons like a video game and get instant like satisfaction. Um, so do you have any plans to make any more designs that incorporate music? Um, well, I don't want to, I don't want to like, um, officially announce it yet, but I would guess we have in the works, uh, if you think yin versus yang, you know, like your shirt, you know, bright contrast, what would be the contrast opposite of box of boom? So that's kind of where I'm leading to is, you know, maybe a more meditative approach to sounds and tones that would be more contemplative kind of. If Box of Boom is expressing outwardly, where would you go to experience sound and tone to be more like maybe a mindfulness space? So I'll leave it kind of like a little bit vague, but we, we, we were playing with ideas like that too. So um, anyways. <laughs> oh yeah, I love, I love that concept. And I could see like the through line through like Bird Up and Box of Boom and the project you're mentioning right now where it's like you're creating these like experiences Besides the design, there's like experience that's attached to it. And that's, that's, I really like that idea. Um, since we're talking about music, uh, what was the last song you listened to? Uh, let's see. Well, um, I mean, I kind of listened to this one song like half a dozen times yesterday because we were doing a kind of a, a fun little music video at the garden. Uh, it's called Grow Food. So if you haven't heard that song, it's like pretty catchy little rap rap song that these kids uh, came out with uh, to promote like growing food. And uh, so we, we did a remix, you know, music video at our garden yesterday, <laughs> May Center, um, with a bunch of local kids who, who like to like, you know, break dance and stuff. So we had like a little floor mat out and they were able to, you know, jump in and do a little dance move. And we're going to kind of cut that up and uh, put it out there just kind of you know, trying to just like bird up and some of these things, you know, trying to make it more fun and playful to do things like sustainability or eating healthy, um, being active. You know, it's like, you know, we do we do music because we enjoy it. But there's yeah, like you were saying, sometimes it's, it's a little threshold to getting to the point where you're actually doing it. And so, you know, people need to be encouraged to, to keep going and um, kind of see it through until they actually have fun doing it. So like whether it's design, music, art, you know, like it's actually kind of tough up until you kind of get the flow. And then it's just like, yeah, it's fun, fun to do it. So um, long story on my song, I could probably name a few others, but Grow Food. Awesome. Yeah, we'll check it out. You were also one of the main or the one of the first studio guides for the studio at the Long Beach Public Library, you know, which is a makerspace in the Long Beach Public Library system. What were the early days of the studio like? Um, well, what I would say is in the early days, like a lot of what we were doing was just creating awareness of what making is or the idea of a maker and how it relates to people outside of art and design. So trying to relate it to well, just all different departments of the library, trying to relate it to all different departments of the city, trying to relate it to, you know, people just, you know, having something that doesn't work at home and being able to fix it or make it or maybe seeing a, a, a problem or something that could be improved and figuring out how to make it better. So it's like, it, it's kind of uh, like in the design department or design field, the idea of design thinking it's, it's kind of applying that to a space and then having a space that allows for design thinking to happen. And so you don't have to be a designer to apply design thinking. You just need to kind of know the, the approaches or uh, it's, it's a lot like just informal troubleshooting, I would say, and having good tools and resources available. So at, at, in the beginning, there was a lot of, uh, you know, even collaborating with different uh, departments or, you know, helping the departments because by working with them, we were doing projects that would showcase how we could actually utilize the space. So and I think that helped with showing other people examples of what could be done there. 
why do you think maker spaces are important? Yeah, so I, I, I've been advocating for maker spaces in Long Beach for a while. And the big reason is the shared resources, um, similar to like a library, we're sharing the resources of having like information and knowledge within books and other information resources. Um, but not everyone has a set of tools, not everyone has the, you know, 3D printer, not everyone has all these resources that, hey, maybe you only need to use it for one little thing, but it costs a lot to buy something from brand new to then do that one little thing. Or sometimes, uh, you know, even if you knew what to do, you don't know how to do it. And sometimes you need guidance. So there, there's a lot of like, I would say, things that are left to the professionals that don't need to be uh, so, you know, difficult to access. And so simple things like home improvements, fixing a broken whatever, um, or, you know, customizing a little, anyways, all the, all the things that you would approach in a maker space um, are things that I, I see people needing but not having access to. And so I, I see libraries are, are a source of that. So it makes sense for maker spaces to be there. Um, and then just as seeing all maker spaces that are out there, they do come in all shapes and sizes. Um, but I think that's kind of the, the bottom driving force is um, creating access for more people. From teaching at Cal State Long Beach, um, we had, and because of you know social issues going on right now, um, we had what was called the scholars strike uh, earlier in the semester. And a student had asked me to, you know, um, address it during the class and it's basically raising awareness of uh, BIPOC and you know social issues and so I didn't you know have anything on hand at the moment um, so to, in, in order to relate 3D printing and like my class which was 3D design 3D printing and BIPOC issues but I did a little bit of research and look also looking at BIPOC within the maker spaces um, saw some really interesting like stats in terms of, you know, how, um, anyways, how non-inclusive makerspaces can be. And there's one demographic that really stood out to me because, um, anyways, from my background in sustainability, I take a lot of uh, insight from like the Native American population, some of their practices and craft work. Um, however, they have the smallest percentage of access or utilization of makerspaces. So I just thought that was a, a really big contrast of, you know, this uh, population of traditional craft making that is, you know, exquisite also is very conscious in terms of sustainability and what happens to this afterwards and what are resources in being used and how is it being utilized. So all this thought that, and mindfulness that goes into crafting, but the people whose, uh, you know, histories and traditions bring it, uh, that pass it along, they're not in the maker spaces. So, I, I, from my projects of being collaborative in nature, uh, I, I can only see benefit from having more collaboration and from a more diverse uh, collaborative source. And specifically, I mean, I think it'd be awesome to have more maker spaces in Native American, uh, you know, communities. So I don't know, I don't have a driving uh, message other than, you know, maker spaces are communal spaces and it should be fully inclusive and we got to, you know, expand that. Where have you traveled and how has traveled inspired your design? Um, I would say I did uh, two study abroad uh, semesters, two different, different years uh, during the summer um, when I was studying design. So I got to study uh, design in London for, for uh, about six weeks. And then a couple of years later, I studied in Florence, Italy. And so that was kind of the first touch off to international travel, but that really opened my eyes to, you know, uh, just different cultures, food, experience, art, you know, just really seeing things from a, you know, worldly perspective. And then uh, kind of my next big adventure was going down to Brazil, um, because I really had like a, you know, drive to see the jungle, like in the Amazon before it was gone. And to just go, I just head straight, headed straight for the jungle. First thing, didn't really know even where I was going, just knew I was going to get in the jungle and then found my way out and survived and then went to the city. Um, anyway, that was like a huge uh, impression in terms of like 
uh, nature and culture uh, from the South, South American perspective. And then the, the real turning point, which uh, in a local group, Green Long Beach, we would call an eco epiphany. Um, so my, my eco epiphany was when I went to China in 2008 as part of a cross-cultural design exchange. Um, I was working at a design consultancy at the time. And you know, prior to that, I had always advocated for sustainable uh, methods in our products that we're designing. But you know, there'd always be you know, um, cost benefit analysis and hey, you know, the sustainable option is just gonna cost too much, we can't do it. So it kind of gets frustrating after a while to advocate for sustainability and not you know, succeed and then the, the turning point was going to China and just seeing factories and coal and smoke and pollution, seeing it firsthand and seeing you know, the planned obsolescence, where does this waste actually go? And you're seeing piles of wires getting melted down to get to the copper inside. You know, it's like, if it's out of sight, out of mind, we don't really think about where our electronics or our products are going. Um, but once you see it in front of you and you think, oh, could, could I be contributing to this? or or could I help improve this? So I, I basically stopped going to work <laughs> at, the, at the consultancy upon returning from uh, China and just started really focusing on, you know, what is a sustainable product? You know, if I'm a product designer, how do I design a, the most sustainable product? And what I came to the conclusion was the most sustainable product is no product, like without product. So or at least uh, something that is like fully integrated in terms of a uh, life cycle analysis. But when I started thinking about it further, the least sustainable um, or one of the least sustainable industries was the food industry. And food is kind of like a product where you develop a food, you grow it, and it's now a tangible item that can be bought and sold and shared. So I, I kind of changed my direction and tried to repivot, you know, using design thinking, uh, processes and principles and applying it to food systems. And so reducing food waste or increasing efficiency in production. And uh, so I was just kind of making like a, a sharp turn uh, in my focus, but at the same time, um, you know, I didn't want to just like throw out theories. So I had to practice it. So I had to start like, you know, I had a, a small balcony, start growing in containers and see what technology can assist in that. And, um, you know, other industries started evolving with, you know, sophisticated plant technology. So start studying those methods, hydroponics, aquaponics, and just, you know, rooftop farming has always been all these uh, advances and methodologies um, that have helped um, agriculture progress. But how do we do it sustainably? So I had to get my hands dirty and really like, um, just take it on to, to show that like, I had first-hand knowledge in um, growing things before I could actually say, you know, an idea and feel confident that it was not just some greenwashing or some, you know, kind of pie in the sky idea. Um, when I first started doing aquaponics, it was trying to teach people um, that, you know, it's a soilless growing system that uses fish waste to feed plants. Um, the big thing that people had reservations was they said, Oh, we're eating plants that, you know, are growing on fish poop. And so it's like they're, you know, offhand that might sound a little weird or gross to some people. But then if you think of any other plant that's grown, it usually has cow manure, chicken manure, horse manure, some sort of fertilizer in there. It's just all of a sudden when you say fish fertilizer, it sounds a little bit different. Or at the time, you know, before aquaponics became a little bit more, more known. So it's, it's kind of just like, bringing people along and making sure that they're uh, knowledgeable about what what's in front of them, first of all, and not just making kind of initial reactions. Definitely. What sparked your initial interest in gardening and aquaponics? Um, I would say I've always enjoyed the garden and just gardening and kind of being around plants and nature. Um, kind of growing up in the Bay Area, Northern California, you know, having a lot of like outdoor time and then coming down to Southern California and you know, having to find my own space sometimes and kind of provide my own plants and stuff. So that, and also just, um, 
Um, I, th I think that the big one is just, you know, trying to grow my own food was really the, the, the turning point, um, trying to figure out, you know, is it really feasible to sustain yourself in the city with what you grow? Is that even possible? Um, so definitely found that you can do a lot growing your own, but it, you know, in the city is, you know, it's, it's not, it's not being on the farm is whole different uh, environment. So <laughs> definitely takes collaboration once again. What was the last thing that you grew yourself and ate? Um, well, we're wrapping up tomato season. So we've been doing like loads of tomatoes. The last thing grew and ate, um, probably a cucumber. I mean, it's the end of summer. So we got cucumbers coming in uh tomatoes peppers so probably one of those awesome can you tell us some of the work tell us about some of the work you've done with uh community gardens here in long beach yeah so i would say the first um uh, kind of getting involved was uh with the growing experience in north long beach it's a urban farm about seven and a half acres on low income housing, um, County of L LA property. And so I, I got brought in with them on like a, it was like an internship or is, um, is an incubator program. So we got some basic training from some of the staff and some volunteer or some, um, you know, other people coming in and we were to propose a project uh, at the, at the end of the incubator training. And so we pitched to do an aquaponics system for the, the farm. And so that's really where my aquaponics, uh, kind of trajectory took off. And, uh, we started with a, just a small, it's an IBC. So it's a IBC tote is a, just an international container and, um, often used in aquaponics. So we did that. We did got that running for one year. It was really successful and we were able to apply it to a $50,000 grant to then retrofit an entire thousand square, square foot greenhouse and turn it into a vertical aquaponic system that they're still using. Um, so that was the kind of the, that, it was like one of my first involvements with uh, urban farming here in Long Beach. It was also like one of the bigger projects, um, I would say in terms of, um, just, uh, you know, the, the, there's, there's no other farm at that scale here in Long Beach. So to have, you know, a full greenhouse and full land and, you know, all those things available, that was pretty, pretty awesome. Um, but since then, um, kind of trying to tie into aquaponics, but having to go a little more, um, less, less, uh, sophisticated, uh, just doing raised beds. We did the garden at the, the learning garden at the Michelle Obama library. And so that, those are the two highlight projects I would mention um, that are kind of like start to finish. Um, but there's been a lot of like yearly projects. Every year we do a collaboration with Leadership Long Beach on MLK Day. And so that's like a day of service. Um, and we'll do some sort of community garden project where we get like 30 plus people and really do something of, uh, you know, a, a good collaborative effort there. So, um, yeah, and then just kind of working with, uh, who else, like even the, the time exchange, I would help out people that just needed like r random assistance and various things that just need some knowledgeable, you know, plant, plant nerd to help out with. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, do you have like a main goal behind your work with urban agriculture? Yeah, the, the main goal is um, sustainability is like kind of the the big overlying goal, but it's such a abstract goal, probably. It, so the more tangible goal is just making your own food, growing your own food and being more connected to plants um, would be the kind of the personal or the individual level goal. Awesome, we're at the tail end of the interview got a couple more questions for you. Thank you, though. Um, so how do you think we can inspire the next generation of designers and people in general to embrace sustainability? 
Um, I, I would, I would say making it a challenge, you know, uh, putting all the, the cards on a table so that, you know, we're not trying to, um, you know, hide anything, you know, full transparency, like, here's what we're up against. Here's your challenge. You know, you have all the tools and the skills. Uh, we believe in you to do it, but we don't have the answers. So it's up to you. <laughs> um, it's like every, everyone, it's not like one person has the answer. So it's really, you know, kind of creating these collective spaces where ideas can be shared and not just shot down. And so it takes, you know, a, a challenge sometimes or a, a challenging idea to present itself. So just for, for the young designers and creative people to kind of, you know, ask those hard questions and try to at least present solutions as opposed to just, you know, um, you know, uh, criticisms. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, D Dave, you, you touch you touched upon a lot of topics and uh, a lot of projects that you've been involved with. Um, thanks for sharing. Really appreciate it. Um, but we'll just keep it simple with one of the last, you know, one of the last questions is, uh, can you tell us a memorable library experience? Uh, let's see. Memorable library experience. Um, well, so many. <laughs> uh, what would be the best one? Most uh, camera friendly? No. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I can't help but laugh. Uh, yeah, let's see. Fix Good it. library oh, experience, please. most memorable. Um, uh, all I right. Mean, how, okay. How about how about we how about we do something a little different? We just go. Um, so is there is there a place uh, this this so this is a moment for you to shout out yourself? Is there a place where people can find out what projects you've worked on? You know who you are. You know and if they want to reach out after seeing this and you know they have a project they want to you know collaborate on. Is there a place that you know people can find you online somewhere? Uh, yeah, I mean I have you know your your usual social media and stuff, uh, personal website. You could probably look me up and and find some. Not necessarily the most active in self promotion, but I would say uh, my like latest collaborative space is called Space Time Collaborative. So spacetimecollaborative.com. Um, that's also just getting kind of started, but it's more uh, kind of personal passion projects um, within the collaborative context and exploring just you know any and all ideas and bird up. Uh, Box of Boom, aquaponics, drones, virtual reality, it's all it's all contained within space time coll collaborative. So that that's where you know I'm directing people at, at this point. So how about that uh, memorable library experience? I mean, talking about the garden so much, I'm just thinking about um, the grand opening of the Michelle Obama Library was also the grand opening of the learning garden at the Michelle Obama Library. And we had, you know, 5,000 people, you know, all over that entire garden, just like in the beds, on the beds, everywhere. And, you know, from, from day one, the community was like already like, hey, don't step there. There's plants. And then like, that's our food, you know, don't step there. And there. So the community from day one was already, uh, you know, taking ownership and protecting it. And, you know, since then, it's been every day I go out there, there's always someone doing something, some, some sort of interaction with a someone's harvesting at any time of the day. Um, and just like, although the, there's been so many good uh, experiences and interactions at that space. Um, and it's, 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 it's really, you know, a great opportunity that it happens to be right next to a library and all the crossover benefit. So it, it just, you know, seeing how inundated with people it was on day one, that was like a memory, but it, it kind of lasts because I see throughout all the years since that it's still had, you know, that lingering uh, residual effect. So it's, that, that's kind of like a highlight for me. Awesome. Thank you so much. That concludes our interview with David Hedden. Thank you for being a wonderful guest and having these really insightful responses to all of our questions.
Thanks for having me. Good to be here.